crisis of severe externalization. The formulation of the concept, Anthropocene, thus inevitably conforms to apocalyptic logic. It indicates that the cosmic insouciance that was the basis for historical forms of human being in the world has come to an end. In conventional terms, we could describe, quote, the human place in the cosmos, end quote, to recall Scheller's treatise, as a kind of scenery ontology, ontology. On this view, the human being, as dramatic animal, performs before the massif of a nature that can never be anything other than a placid background for human operations. Such scenic, ontological thought remained predominant for quite a while, even after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, although nature as background is nowadays construed as an integral storehouse of resources and a universal landfill. The possibility that resources might be exhausted is only entertained later on. In 1912, the German chemist Wilhelm Ostwald, 1853 to 1932, was the first to explicitly conceptualize the finiteness of terrestrial resources in his text, Der Energetische Imperative, the Energetic Imperative. In this work, he was already critical of industry and the state, because no infinite superstructure can be erected upon a finite base. Humanity is immediately called upon to adopt an alternative ethos in its use of nature, in brief, the energetic imperative is, quote, do not waste energy, or use it, end quote. Because wars represent the worst form of the waste of energy, they should immediately vanish from humanity's behavioral repertoire. An argument that, two years prior to the outbreak of the First World War, was not entirely beside the point. The quote-unquote analytic of finitude which a little later on was translated by Heidegger from the sphere of the natural sciences into an existential dimension, belong, begins with Ostwald's text. Even Max Weber's most famous statement, found at the end of his essay, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, from 1920, contains a covert reply to the Ostwaldian ethics of frugality for finite creatures in a finite world. Weber claims that the current economic system holds the human being spellbound within a quote-unquote iron cage, and quote, with irresistible force determines the lives of all the individuals who are born into this mechanism. Perhaps it will so determine them until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt, end quote. Werner Zombart recalled a more dramatic version of the same thought. In conversation with him, Weber sometimes remarked that capitalism would not come to an end until, quote, the last ton of iron and the last ton of coal had been smelted, end quote. The equation of capitalism with old-fashioned heavy industry reveals the extent to which this remark is dated, and not only because of the internal dialogue with Ostwald. Although new agents could already be recognized around 1920 as they emerged into the social-industrial stage, at least in outline. Petroleum, chemistry, financial capital, solar power, telecommunications are not mentioned. Talk of the quote-unquote last ton clearly indicates the apocalyptic logic of Weberian reasoning. Thanks to his rapid fast-forward to the system's death, the melancholy sociologist attains a synoptic view of quote-unquote capitalism as worldwide fatality. The supplanting of traditional scenery ontology by an ecological logic reaches far back into the 19th century. In their text, The German Ideology, from 1845-7, to 7, Marx and Engels had already succinctly postulated a shared history of nature and man, though natural history was subsequently left aside since they wished to limit themselves to studying the historical formulations of quote-unquote relations of production. This omission characterized an age in which the difference between intended products and unintended side effects had not yet become critical. 
something that only became typical in the late 20th century. Furthermore, in their cheerful productivity, Marx and his successors were relying on a basic fundamental assumption of scenery ontology, according to which nature, reinterpreted as resource, was supposed to perpetually reabsorb industrial production's externalised effects, more or less unnoticeably. The assumption of an infinitely indulgent external nature extended the lifespan of human beings' cosmic recklessness recklessness after the Industrial Revolution, so that it lasted longer than it would have, given the environmental problems that were just emerging. With the end of carelessness, even scenery ontology, and the fundamental age-old distinction of foreground and background, reached the limits of their plausibility. <laughs>